Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The Doug Show. My name is Doug Cunnington, and in this episode, I'm excited. I'm talking to Carl Hughes, and he's the founder of Draft.dev, where they create technical marketing content for companies. And I'm reading his intro verbatim. He made it very easy for me. Carl has been very transparent about sharing his process on his blog. And within 12 months, they have over 30 clients, 120 contract employees, actually over that. And in 2021, they're going to be over a million dollars in revenue. Today, we're going to talk about how to find an idea to work on in a service-based business, hitting your first 10K and figuring out how to scale that up. So Carl, how are you doing today? Um, awesome, Doug. Thanks so much for having me on. This is really a pleasure. Absolutely. Now, I don't know you that well. We just met a few minutes ago. So can you give an intro, a little bit about your background and how you ended up uh, in this spot today with Draft.dev? Yeah. So for the last almost 10 years, I've been a software engineer, engineering manager, and then uh, last role was a CTO at a small startup. So I've been like the first engineer hired to build an early product and on the side, this is kind of where draft.dev sort of like the idea emerged. I'd, I'd been writing on the side for fun and, well, an attempt at profit many times. Uh, that took a couple different iterations. Most, uh, like I, I wrote on a personal blog for, you know, every couple months probably for, for years. And some of those posts I tried to make kind of like affiliate posts, like doing best of roundups and things. And it was super inconsistent and super hard for me to stick with it and find a theme. And then a couple of years ago, a few years before I started Draft, actually, I, I started a site called Ship PHP, and it was like a, a PHP and Docker sort of content niche site. And I was thinking I was going to make a course and eBooks and, and start you know monetizing that. And I I did this for I probably did it for close to a year and just got really burned out. Um, it was really hard for me to create that like just ongoing content um, and and not get bored of the topic. Like PHP and Docker is like super niche. I didn't really care about it that much. I was writing, you know, I wrote, probably wrote 60, 70 articles and I'm like, I'm done with this. Like, this is, this is enough. Uh, and so long story short, I knew a lot about content and writing a lot in addition to software engineering, which is a weird combination of skills. Uh, so last year I was, the, the, the pandemic hit and I started thinking like what my, the company I was working with started to kind of hit a rough patch. And so I was like, what do I want to do next? I started saying, well, maybe I'll just become a writer and start like a small writing agency around software writing. Ended up finding a bunch of clients. And like you said, it's grown like gangbusters because we're in such a narrow niche uh, doing such a very specific thing that very few other content agencies will do because of the technical nature of the content. All of our writers are software engineers. And so it's really hard to find them, people like that who want to write. So we've kind of carved out a little space in the world where there just weren't a lot of competitors and there's a lot of demand that happens to be out there. Amazing. And before we hit record, you mentioned that you, you did try to sort of dabble in some affiliate marketing pieces. And um, I get this sort of question all the time where it's, how could I do this faster? How could I earn money faster? And I, I try to emphasize like, you know, be patient if you're going to do affiliate marketing or anything where you get organic traffic via SEO, it'll take longer, but sometimes there's a nice flywheel situation that happens and you have some nice momentum, but you don't get money quickly. You put in a lot of hours. Um, with this company, this agency that you pulled together, did you have any expectations about like how quick you would be able to start earning and then scale up? Yeah. I mean, part of the reason for starting an agency was just personal limitations. It was either going to be get a job because I didn't have, you know, years of savings. Right. So it was either get a job or find a business model that would generate enough money to pay me a decent wage, uh, you know, pretty quickly. And honestly, like services and productized services, both are, are really good for that, like generating immediate revenue. And so I knew I would get something, you know, I knew I'd be able to pay myself within a month or two. And that was, that was very true. Even before I went full time on it, I kind of had some of this going as a side project. So, um, it really, it spun right up. Um, now, as far as like how quickly I'd be able to hire a team and actually get out of production work, I did not think it was going to go this fast. That I think was uh, a bit of luck and timing, but also having built a prior, like a network from being an engineer and engineering manager for 10 years, I knew a lot of people. And so when I went out and started this, I just started hitting up that network and using these. This is not like a, a, a typical engineering skill, but just like going out and talking to people is super valuable in if you're going to start this kind of business. So that was kind of what, what drove it in the early days. We got a lot of referrals from consultants, uh, people who were in the 
what they, it's called the developer marketing space that that wanted to wanted this kind of content but didn't know how to produce it, especially at scale. And then we've done good work for clients, and they refer us to new ones. All these clients share similar investors and and uh, and marketing consultants and teams that that kind of work with them. And so there's a lot of like interplay between different clients within this little niche that that they trade uh, trade around ideas and agencies like us. Why do you have the writing skills that you have? Back in college, I used to do uh, writing. This is the nerdiest thing ever. I was, first of all, I'm an engineering major, so it was like I was a nerd anyway. But like second nerdy thing, I was hanging at my my roommates were all English majors, and we would sit together on Friday, Thursday, Friday nights, little beer, little weed, probably, and like do short story competitions with each other. We just give each other like short story prompts and have to like write them and read them out loud. I mean, it's so lame, right? Like I can't even make up a nerdier story, but that was like, it's funny. Like it kind of got me into like hooked into writing. I wasn't writing much as an engineering major and these guys were, you know, we're hanging out and doing this stuff. And I was like, this can kind of be fun and creative and interesting. And that was one of the first, the first situations where I realized I liked writing. And then I really tried to lean into that uh, throughout my career, just like write on the side, write about what we're doing at work, write about the, the the jobs we had open, things like that. And it all attracts people. I mean, writing is a super valuable skill, regardless of whether you directly monetize it through affiliate revenue or do something completely different. Okay. Well, and as an engineer also, I can relate to the nerdy stuff, but is, I mean, you're bringing a creative piece in, you were drinking, smoking weed. So I'm on board. Sounds like <laughs> sounds like a good sort of outlet there. And I, I wish I knew that communication was like the most important skill because I didn't pay attention to that for several years. Okay. So you have the, the writing skill, you um, have a good network and in your IT management and then your CTO roles, did you do a lot of like of the HR roles, hiring teams, bringing people on, setting up your systems and such? Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, for sure. One of the the big things when you're an early manager at a startup is you're going to have to hire a lot of people. Ideally, the company is going to raise money, they're going to grow quickly, and you're going to be like constantly hiring basically. And so, um, there were a few things that I brought from that experience that made it really easy for me to start hiring other writers and editors. And, you know, now as we grow, we have account managers, a salesperson, like it's just, you know, it's a whole team. Um, and so a few things that I picked up one, uh, creating rubrics or some kind of like guidelines around who you're hiring, what you're looking for, the skills you're looking for is really important. And a lot of people overlook this and they hire based purely on gut feel rather than any kind of objective metrics about the, the job and what skills the person really needs. And that's really dangerous because you end up getting a bunch of people that just you like talking to, which is okay, but they may not have the skills you actually need to get stuff done. Um, the other thing is testing people with real, as true to life simulations as possible. So if you're gonna get hire a writer, pay them for a small writing sample. I mean, that sounds obvious for writing, but even for other roles, you can do this. We did this with engineering hires. We would, you know, have them do a code project, pay them for, you know, their time if need be, um, or have them come in and work with us one-on-one -on, -one on a paired project. Uh, so that kind of thing is really important in every role. And I continue to do this with everybody, no matter the seniority level, like you're going to have some sort of project to do throughout the hiring process so that I see you're not just looking at quality of work. You're also looking at, do they actually return stuff on time? Do they do what they say they're going to do. Can they understand commands and basic, can they ask questions when they don't just all this stuff, you start to get a sense of their work uh, ability and that what it's like actually working with them. Perfect. And I think like WordPress and probably a bunch of other companies do that paid projects so that you could actually see the output of an individual, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot cheaper to pay somebody a couple hundred dollars to do a sam sample project than to pay them $40,000 for half a year's work and then have to fire them. And that's just, I mean, orders of magnitude. So it's an easy, a no brainer to me. Absolutely. Okay. So let's get into sort of like the actionable step by step. And we're going to try to make this generic. So someone without your background, because you have a unique set of skills and, and pulled everything together. And then you had, you know, a decade in the, uh, in the office working, networking and all that stuff. So we'll try to make it general. Um, let's start with finding an idea and, I, and I'll let you guide. So, um, we can sort of take it step by step and you could pause and I'll ask 
questions along the way, but let's say you don't have any ideas and you can make up someone's background or job if you want to give us like a real life example. Yeah. So to speak again from personal experience, and I think like this, this is generally applicable instead of thinking about like, what is the big bang idea that's going to set me free, which I think a lot of people can fall into that trap. It's like, it must be unique and it must be really uh, a huge idea. Like it's got to be Google level or else don't do it. You know, that I don't think that's really true. 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs are doing stuff that's already been done before. They're just doing it maybe in some unique way, or they just think they're better at it than other people. So what I would do is look around you. And what I did is like looked around myself and said, like, what are some of the unique skills I have and connections I have? And how could I leverage those to get the most, uh, the best start? So I think of entre like a lot of the successful entrepreneurs I meet, they sort of cheat in a way that that is maybe not obvious to the outside world. So you hear like, you know, a company like ours has grown really quickly, like, wow, what did Carl do? It's like, well, I used the things I already had 10 years of experience in and leveraged those to the maximum rather than trying to do something I had no familiarity with. If I had started a, like an organic farm, I have absolutely zero connections, zero experience in it. I would have gone nowhere in a year, right? I would have been just learning the basics. Whereas instead I started at something I was at a level that was pretty high already at. So I think one thing to think about is like, what do you already have to leverage that you can get you know, really quickly into a point where it's it's making real money and real profit. Um, and then the other thing is uh, sort of merging of ideas. And this, again, is what I did. It was like there were companies already doing this kind of like content production as a service. There were productized services that do just blog posts. I'm sure, you know, everybody's familiar with these kinds of things. Uh, but there weren't many, if any, that I could find in our niche. And I knew our niche had a demand for this. It was just a matter of like, getting mashing these two ideas that already existed together. So it's just a, it's, it's an iterative process. It's not something that um, you, there's not like one path to this, but it's absolutely something where you can like look around you at what you have access to and what ideas you see resonating in other spaces and then apply them to where your experience lies. Perfect. So a person should have a look and maybe hopefully they like what they have been working on and they could build upon that. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe they've got something like they're in a unique location or they've got a, uh, they're in an area where there's, there's not a certain service or a certain business like theirs that they want to start. So it's just, it could be some other lever too. Okay. Got it. And what kind of dog do you have? <laughs> That's right. Uh, Chili is a, a mutt and she hates the mailman. So she's, oh, okay. you know, man, happened to be walking by. Yeah. She's, she's just a, a rescue dog, but she's, she's great. She loves, uh, loves fetch and uh, playing with my son. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We like dogs around here. I just wanted to make sure everyone, everyone knew it wasn't Georgie. It's Carl. That's right. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, from there, I, I think Maybe we just follow along with what you did. So you started freelance writing and you were doing the writing yourself. Where did you find your first clients as you were just, I guess, really testing out the idea? Yeah, I so initially I joined um, some different writing programs that already existed. And I think this is a thing you hear a lot from freelancers when they're just getting started is maybe they join Upwork or Fiverr or something. I did, those platforms don't have as good of a fit for the kind of writing I do, but there were already some uh, what they call community writer programs for software developers. So I joined a couple of those. That was step kind of step zero. I, I started asking I started writing for some community writing programs and then started asking my contacts there if they'd hop on a call and we could, I could get in deeper to like how they worked and what the economics of it were. I started digging in deep, like figuring out, is there, is there more demand for this than there is supply or is it vice versa? Then they started making introductions to other companies that didn't maybe have a whole program, but kind of wanted a dedicated writer. And then those introductions kind of turned into more referrals and it just, it really like, honestly, I, I set a goal for myself in the early days. Like I would never spend more than 50% of my freelance time doing production, like actually writing content. I would always spend at least half of it going out and getting new business in some form or fashion. So there's things like writing blog posts, writing guest posts, going on and um, uh, talking to people, having these calls, these introductions, getting warm introductions, meeting with consultants in our space, just like a lot of meetings. And you know, some percentage of those paid off and I stay in touch with those people and it occasionally works out. And that's what you, it kind of got a flywheel going as well. Okay. So these are early days and I'm, I'm curious, 
if you made any mistakes or are there any things that went sideways in those early couple months maybe? So one of the, the <laughs> I don't know why I was so naive to think this, but I assumed that all software engineers who had ever written a blog post got it like I did. And I could just give them a title of a blog post and they would just write a great article. And I imagine anybody in your audience who's paid freelance writers to do writing for them knows how tricky, like how tough that really is. Like in reality, there, there's a small percentage of really great writers who could do that kind of thing. They can kind of like self, uh, self build a brief and self edit and all that. But like the reality is 99.9% .9 of writers, especially these people I was working with, they were not professional writers. They can't do anywhere near that level of, of self driven work on writing. So what I, I quickly like made a ton of mistakes around giving out these like ideas for articles. And I would just give them to a random person who had really didn't know and they would write just complete crap and then i would have to rewrite it all myself like the night before it was due and it was just very inefficient not a good idea at all uh so i quickly learned you have to create briefs for writers and it has to be pretty specific and you should give them if you give them an outline and things like that you can really help them guide them along if you then you then also have to plan to edit their work and you have to build that in your, your pipeline and your timeline uh and so all these things like were really they seem there's such naive mistakes. Like anybody who's ever done content production professionally would know not to do them, but I was a total novice. And so it's like, I'm just assuming everybody's going to be just like me. And it's it, not everybody is like quite that same level of skill in all areas. Okay. And w where did you find those early writers and, and some of your first staff? Uh, it was a mix, a little bit on places like Upwork or freelance platforms, uh, a little bit of directly reaching out to people in my network who I knew, a little bit of uh, posting on job boards and things. Um, and it was just it, it also we would directly reach out to writers. In fact, we still do that a fair bit, like when there's a really specific technical topic that we don't have a writer for we have to go find people who are writing about it or find people on LinkedIn with those skills and then recruit them explicitly. So that can be really tricky, but uh, like in the kind of really niche stuff that we write, it it's kind of the only way to do it. Okay. And how many people do you have writing and, and what does the team look like? It sounds very large at this point. Yeah. I mean, with, you know, with a service business like this, you kind of have to have a fair bit of human capital at work. So we have eight full-time staff, about 10 uh, regular contractors. These are like editors and um, uh, technical reviewers who are, are part-time, but they're very consistent. So they're 10, 20 hours a week. And then um, about 150 writers who are kind of, they, they just pick up one-off writing assignments a couple times a month. Um, so it's a, it's a big network, but it's sort of like different tiers of commitment level uh, at different roles. Okay. Did you hire all the writers and or the whole team or what so <laughs> yeah, I mean over time I've been able to hire managers who now manage and hire their own small sub teams. So today I hire right now my focus is on the growth side, so sales and account management and marketing. And then I have a uh, content side where I have a couple of leaders who do like lead one leads the the, the writers and technical people and the other leads the editorial and less technical staff. And they do most of the hiring for those roles. Of course, initially I was hiring all those roles and, um, but quickly like that becomes really, really hard to, to maintain, especially as we've grown so quick. Okay. And it sounded like you don't have too many full-time folks and a lot of it is just sort of ad hoc. There's people that you, you can, check uh in your pool of writers and bring them on is that right yeah yeah i mean eight okay. full-time and then the, you know a large like freelance pool that's kind of rotating and you know again some of them are pretty consistent they're they just like maybe where they're one of their main clients and they have other freelance clients as well this happens to be i find with a lot of editorial and writing jobs they tend to be very freelance oriented the writers tend to and, and editors tend to kind of like freelance writing and working working in that fashion. So they may have five or six clients that they work with, um, but we're kind of like a good steady one for them. And then because of the technical nature of the writing that needs to be done, are all the writers uh, like engineers or software people of some yeah. kind? Yeah, all of them are, they almost all have a day job or they're freelance engineers and they do this on the side. Uh, some of them are consultants. Uh, you know, for them, it's a mix of motivations. like. The side money is great. 
um, but they still get paid way more as engineers in most cases. So what we also do is we rarely do ghostwriting. Uh, and the reason for that is that our writers also get the credit. So they'll also share that article, which can be mutually beneficial. The client like, gets to put a, a real subject matter expert on their article rather than just like, you know, so-and-so at the marketing department is talking about our product again. Like that's actually not that compelling when you're talking about this technical audience that wants to read things by and for software engineers. So that's the way it works for us. Obviously, it's going to be different in other industries. And so a lot of content agencies, when they they, they have to do ghostwriting, because that's sort of the nature of their um, of their kind of clients that they work with. Okay. And I'm jumping around a little bit, but I forgot to ask something before. So um, initially, when you were looking at the overall market and thinking, hey, I could actually grow this thing, are there other agencies, other competitors out there that sort of prove the market is there and you can see that they're writing for many companies so that you know that it's big enough for you to come in and earn some money? Yeah, honestly, I did not know. I didn't think it was going to be big enough. <laughs> I, I just thought it would be like, something where, you know, I could write, do some of this writing and maybe eventually hire a couple staff. And like, um, I did not do like detailed market research. And this is probably like a failing, to be honest, like if I could go back, I probably should have known that this is, you know, now looking back, this is like the space we work in is like a $50 billion market. So it's, that's, it's pretty fairly good size and it's growing 20% a year. So both of those things have like combined to where it's like plenty big for a new player to, to come in and carve a space. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. And honestly, that was kind of like one of the things that I would, if I were to start again, I would look a lot more at those numbers and see like, is this a, is this a space where there is high growth potential or is it more of like a, you know, tapped out market that's slow, slowly declining or flatlining that we could just kind of like, we'd have to fight really hard to get into. Okay. And just to clarify, the market that you're talking about is like the content side of technical content. This is really, it's actually really the, um, the, the market of companies that are trying to sell to software developers and we service that market. So, you know, the, the percentage of that 50 billion they're spending on content is small, but it's plenty big for a few competitors. And again, there's only a couple other people in our space. So it's, um, you know, in the millions and probably hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, if I had to guess. Um, and the the big competitors are really just, do the companies want to do it in-house themselves or are they looking to outsource it and sort of use an agency in that expertise? Okay, gotcha. And then can you tell us about the tools that you're using from like a project management standpoint or how do you stay out of email or how, how does the communication happen? Yeah, it's like, as I get more and more to be a manager and less of a doer, my job is just calls and emails like all day, basically. Like, I, like it or not, this is one of those things too that I caution entrepreneurs who, or like people who want to start a business, is like, you don't realize how quickly your job is going to be just keeping everyone else unblocked. And that's just a necessary piece, especially if you're growing. Once you get to a certain level of stability, you can start to put in like key managers who answer all the questions and you can kind of sit back a bit more. But a service business like this, it takes a while to get to that point. So, um, yeah, what we use is Airtable for a lot of our behind the scenes work. Airtable is a really flexible, uh, scalable CMS backend sort of thing that almost works like an advanced version of a spreadsheet. If I had to just dumb it down really, really far. Uh, we use Notion for internal docs and like uh, SOP, standard operating procedures, kind of tell new people how we do our work. And we may record and embed Loom videos as well. We're all remote and all asynchronous, um, almost all asynchronous. We do a monthly team meeting, but it's very little like everyone here at the same time. And that has some interesting challenges around tooling and culture, both that are pretty unique. Like it's easy to build an office culture when you have an office or you have at least like all these dedicated times to stand up and talk with people. But when we're almost all doing our work at our own time zones, our own leisure, it's a totally different thing. And I think that's something we're still figuring out. Okay. Yeah. The that is a little tough, especially, I mean, I guess people are getting used to sort of working at home, but I, I know that that sort of maybe erases the culture that existed. And like you said, sort of the side conversations when you're walking to the uh, parking lot or grabbing lunch or wasting time and trying not to work for a few minutes. Like those are, those are valuable conversations you just don't get to have. Yeah. And it's like, it's also helps people just like 
have something kind of fun, you know, at work. Like when, when your work is just all work because nobody else is there to talk to and divert you, it can be a little, um, that can be challenging for some people. I think the way, the way I think about it is we probably, honestly, we probably are sitting at our desk working for fewer hours on average than people who go to desk jobs and, in a, you know, actually commute. But at the same time, um, we can, with the right tooling and the tooling so good now, like it's not that hard to stay connected and have a good paper trail for all of our key decisions and keep track of what is going on at any given time. But you do have to be organized about it. At some point, you thought, all right, I'm going to scale this up, you know, looking at the growth because the company's only, what, like a year and a half-ish? Yeah, a year and a couple months, yeah. So what what did you do to plan that? Um, it's probably, a, it sounds like the way you were getting referrals, it could have been really easy to take on too much work and grow fast. Or even if you could pay writers and hire, you know, 60 people, you'd be answering emails all day and you would you would be the bottleneck at that point. So how did you scale so quickly yet seemingly in a sustainable way? Yeah, yeah, we've been pretty good about balancing this. Um, so a couple things, like first of all, I, my philosophy on this is, is say yes until like it hurts as far as if new business is coming in. I think more businesses die because they are afraid to grow than businesses die because they overgrow. Now, maybe that's like naive. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Statistically, I just feel that that hearing it from other entrepreneurs that they really limit themselves and they don't believe they can do more. So they just say no to new work. Um, so we focused very heavily on processes, though, even from the beginning having really strong processes about how things are done and only doing things in a very certain way has been really key. And that means saying no to clients, which is really hard for, again, like a lot of entrepreneurs, like compare and contrast here, like a lot of service company entrepreneurs, they kind of just want to say yes to everything a client will pay them for. Uh, but that is the like, that's the fast track to doing a million things and doing nothing well. And so we just very early said, we're going to standardize everything. We do a 1,500-ish word blog posts. There's four types of blog posts we deliver. We show these to clients. We kind of classify every piece before it goes into the system. We have very set deliverables for each of those. Certain ones will come with screenshots and code samples. Other ones will come with you know, a, a stock image or a, a diagram. And then we have a very set process for how things go and every person who touches them along the way due dates get set for all those key people at different times and things just move through that system. And there are standard ways to deal with like revisions and other, you know, the sort of like diversions that happen. But at the same time, like each piece we produce goes through the same exact process. There's no special considerations. And that means we say no to a lot of clients who want those things because it's just not going to fit with our system. So that's been key for us is the processes saying yes and then knowing that we could set up a process or have a process for it and being very limited in what we offer. Was it hard to decide exactly what the offering would be? <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, it meant at the beginning, it meant turning over basically every client that I got in the first three months to figure out what our real offering was. Uh, also, like along that that same vein we basically like lowered our offerings and raised prices at the same time but what we did was we scaled the offering so instead of having uh like the minimum package used to be you could just buy a blog post or three blog posts or something like that was the minimum package now the minimum is 12 and the price is almost twice as high but oddly enough like when you work in a 12 article package you're only dealing with companies that are pretty serious about content um especially this kind of very specific niche technical content mm -hmm. and so we sort of like outpriced ourselves from the bottom half of the market which is great because now we're working with people that are more established and what we're able to do is like produce at a higher um, higher scale than most other, like any other freelancer could do. So they're not comparing our price to a freelance writer who could do a couple articles a month or maybe four or five articles a month. We have clients doing 20 and 30 articles a month, but you just can't reproduce with a freelancer. Perfect. And then speaking of, of clients, one reason I don't, uh, I, I never went the agency route. I tried to do a couple things and I, <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. So yeah. how do you deal with the clients and uh, stay sane? Yeah, man, the, you're asking a good question. You've clearly done this or tried this <laughs> to some extent because that is that is the hard part. Um, 
So I don't have magic here other than hiring other people has been a huge burden off. Like now I only hear about client issues when they get to a pretty high level of escalation. And there's so few now because again, the, we've got pretty good processes and I'm always focused on empowering the team to take care of problems themselves. Um, so it's rare now that I lose sleep over client work at, at, at this point. But uh, the first six months, I absolutely did. Like almost every week I had a night where I was like, oh crap, are we going to get this thing back on time? Or is this going to be late? Are they going to cancel with this because of it? Are they going to ask for more? You know, and uh, it's really hard mentally. I mean, I would not want to stick in that phase for very long. That If I had had years of just like slogging it out, worrying of like being the client relationship manager, I don't think I would have been able to like hang with this. But we've gotten to a point now where, again, I can have like three account managers who own that. And they 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 don't I don't think they lose sleep over it because they're not as it's not their business. So they're not as connected to the, you know, every, worrying about it. But we also have enough clients that we know we can lose some some quarters and we can gain some some quarters. And it's like that's the game we're playing. It's all fine. It's hard, though, that that first part. That's probably what turns most people off of service businesses is that you're going to have to do a lot of this one on one communication and talking to clients that is painful and annoying and it's going to you're going to get an email at 9 9 p.m and they're going to want things it's it's tough <laughs> did you uh did you have some some issues where like you were behind schedule you delivered it late and, and there was a problem how, how did you address that to either you know keep the client or you know fire them how, however you need <laughs> <Yeah>. to do <laughs> i mean there's been a few cases like any business is getting started we've We've bitten off more than we can chew a couple of times. And, you know, we've had, I think in uh, earlier this year, we had maybe like two clients where we really just blew it on the first or second article. And it just, it, you know, when you, when you blow it early in a relationship with a client, that really sours the whole thing going forward. And it's really hard to win that back. So one thing we've been, you know, again, learning from that, that mistake, it's like we really put extra emphasis to make sure first articles are always the top quality. We only use trusted writers and editors. We don't try to like, you know, you don't want to put the brand new person who hasn't made all the mistakes yet on your very first article with a client. So we're getting smarter about things like that and that helps prevent it. But it, it's, yeah, it's mentally taxing when, you know, you, you trust, you want, like, I want to trust the team to do things, but they're not perfect and they're all brand new because we're, we're growing so quickly and I'm trying to hire people and train them without enough resources to do so well. And so you, they're going to make mistakes, but I, it's been really important to me to have a short memory and then keep it in perspective. So I started working a couple months ago with a, a, a business coach, like an entrepreneurial coach. And that's been awesome just to like, again, he always makes me pull out and like, look at the big picture, what really matters here. Not like, are you mad about this hundred dollars you're going to lose or gain? You know, like, don't worry about that. What really matters. And um, it, just having some way to get that perspective, maybe mastermind group can be helpful too. something like that is really good. And j just from a delegating and getting rid of some of the decisions that you would have to make and getting rid of some of the responsibility to just to free your mind, is there some threshold or um, that, that you use specifically, I think in the four hour work week, Tim Ferriss says, if it's under whatever, a hundred or $250, like, I don't even care, figure it out yourself and then it'll be fine. So yeah, what, what kind of metric do you use to help make those decisions? Totally. Uh, that's a really good one. I started doing that with our account managers and editors recently. Just like, look, if it's unless it hits this level, I don't care to hear about it. You can just decide among yourselves how you want to handle it. And I, I approve all expenses, rewrites, whatever you have to do. Um, but another thing I've done pretty diligently since I started was track my time. And what I wanted to figure out in doing that is not like how many and we're not doing billable hours. This is like a fixed fee kind of kind of thing. So it's just to see like what the breakdown of my time is. How much time do I spend on sales calls versus marketing and outreach versus um, actually account management, like managing like communication with clients versus uh, bill collecting, P, uh, HR, like all the functions that a business owner does at this stage. And once each of those functions gets to a certain threshold, say it's probably 10 to 20 hours a week, that's when I start to say this needs to go. Like there's no way I can do this sustainably anymore if, or else I'll become the bottleneck. It won't get done or it'll get done worse. So at that point, I start to look at hiring someone full time. Um, if it's if it's like a five to 10 hour thing, I might look at a part time person. But honestly, like you, you I, what I've realized is a, a new person comes on and they're not immediately 100 percent effective. And so. 
you need to be ready and hiring them before you absolutely are underwater and you have to hire them. So if you can hire them when that task is taking five to 10 hours a week uh, or 10 to 20, maybe you'll get them onboarded by the time that thing is 30 or 40 hours a week. And that sort of saves you from getting underwater and not being able to do the things that really matter. That is very insightful. And I assume your, you know, previous experience in your management roles informed you that you need to do that. Otherwise you're really screwed. If you hire someone right when you need them, like you're actually going to be behind when they come asking yeah, questions. Totally. And what's interesting though, and I think this kills a lot of service business owners again, it, that my friends who run businesses like this, that they can't, they, they run into these cash flow situations where they want to hire, like they know they should start hiring because they need someone to start taking on this task. But the clients are paying them, say, net 30 or net 90, which means the 90 or 30 days after they delivered the work. So they're going to have to float this person's salary for up to three months while they get onboarded and before the client pays them. That is incredibly hard to do. And it really stifles your growth. Like you can't add many clients quickly if that's a limiting factor. So one thing we've started to do to help us keep growing is basically push clients to pay up front. So we used to do monthly payment plans. Now it's all quarterly. Um, and that... It, just as a huge like cash flow burden off. We've also like gotten a line of credit and things like that to help us just have more um, more space in case we need to hire a little ahead of revenue and we think we're going to match it. But it's I, if somebody had told me that, it could have saved me a ton of sleepless nights too because I did not realize that growth was going to be really like suck up all my cash and make it really hard to, to keep payroll going. Right. Man, yeah. It, like you said, you don't know, you may not get paid for 90 days or like, oh yeah, that, that's great. You sent me the invoice. Um, we'll get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, as we're, we're wrapping it up, I just have a few more questions here. So um, I, I asked you about several mistakes and you had some, some good stories. What sort of unexpected success or positive aspect has come out of this whole endeavor? Yeah. Um, I, you know, one thing I realized in this that I didn't expect was that I like sales if they are like doing sales, like actually being on sales calls and helping customers and clients solve their problems a lot more than I thought it would. I, I think I initially thought of sales like a lot of engineers do is kind of a slimy, annoying thing that that like, you know, the the. I don't know. I just said the vision of salespeople and it's not good for engineers. And I think that's misguided. I think a lot of the best salespeople now that I've met some and had to do it for a while, they they're just more like they're consultants. They help you solve your problems. And if this product or service we're selling is the right fit, they're going to tell you it is. If the good ones will tell you if it's not too, like they don't want to bring on clients and customers that are going to take everyone else's energy and time and make it worse for the business as a whole. So part of, Part of that has just been learning like what real like good service sales is and being very consultative sales. Uh, that's been awesome and just really like unlocked a whole, I feel like a whole career path. Like if I decided not to do this anymore, I could get into like technical sales and I think it'd be interesting. I think it'd be a cool thing to get into. So uh, yeah, you just never know what you're going to, what what skill you might actually like once you, you have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Again, as an engineer and someone who worked not in sales and marketing, we're like, oh, sales and marketing, they're the worst. But they're not so bad. They usually, they're pretty fun, actually. Once you I, yeah, <laughs> especially once you see it start working, you know, and then you're like, oh, man, this is the thrill of that close is, so that's like nothing else. So fun. So tons of growth, uh, really short timeline. What's next, say, in the next 12 to 18 months? What do you see on the horizon for draft.dev? Yeah, the big things are, um, we're kind of starting to add in, you know, I, I've said we've been very specific with offering a very limited set of services. We're gonna start adding a couple new complimentary services to, to help tack those on with our for our clients, existing clients especially. Uh, and then the other thing we're starting to look at is like, what does, what is taking this to the next level like? So in other words, we're in a very, again, we're a very niche market. We could either go into another vertical. We could say like, okay, we're going to now do technical content for doctors or for uh, mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers or something. I have no idea, but there's other verticals we could explore. Um, and then the other option is 
hitting the edges of the market that we don't currently service well. So we are kind of in a certain price point and scope of work where we do really well for the kinds of companies we're working with today. But what if we wanted to build out a service or product offering that worked for the lower half of the market that we can't service because they're they're too price sensitive at this point? So that could be a marketplace of writers for them to hire and do it themselves. It could be a um, kind of a, a lower cost uh, get started package that essentially like gives you a maybe fewer quality checks. You have to do more of those in house, but we'll kind of get you set up and help guide you through the startup process. So I don't know exactly, but we're starting to look at that because uh, there it is. I think it's important to keep growing and exploring or else you can kind of get stagnant and this, the, the market around you will not stagnate. It will keep growing and changing and exploring. I mean, we're doing something today that clearly is in demand, but that means competitors are coming, right? Like I know there's dozens of small competitors that are all aiming for the same spots that we are. So it's not going to stay. We can't just do the exact same thing we've been doing and expect to continue to get great results uh, forever. How many hours do you work per week, would you say? Uh, so again, I'm a time tracker, so I know um, <laughs> I work 30 to 40 a week. Uh, my whole team, that's our sort of target is in that range. Um, and I'm now at the point where I can take a vacation. That was a big, a big uh, milestone. And this is one of my big goals for this first year was like, I need to get people like managers in place to where I could take a week or two off at a time and it wouldn't hurt the business in a significant way. We would like all general business would move forward. And we're now at that point. So I'm really looking forward to doing that in December to, to exercise that, that, uh, that freedom. <laughs> That's fantastic. You will definitely enjoy the time off. Okay. Well, is there anything else that I forgot to ask you that you want to share before I let you plug where people can find you and all that? No, no. I think this is really fun. I hope this is a, a different take on entrepreneurship maybe than than typically we get at the, the Doug show. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, right on. Well, Carl, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Carl L. Hughes and Carl's with a K. So you can find me there or uh, you can learn about the business at draft.dev. Uh, I also have a personal site at carlhughes.com where I write about business stuff more and less about the the tech and um, uh, the content marketing. So yeah, happy to connect with people and answer questions too, if I can be helpful. Okay. And are you currently hiring writers? I know there's a lot of tech people in my audience with software backgrounds. So just can they reach out for that yeah. as well? Absolutely. Yeah. We're always hiring um, software engineers who want a side gig writing. So draft.dev slash write. There's a page that talks about what, how, you, how it works and what we do. Um, and then we actually right now are hiring three different editorial roles as well. So if anybody happens to be a freelance editor or full time looking for a full time editing role, in either case, we've got some roles that are, are out there, too. So, um, yeah, I think that's that you, if you search draft.dev jobs, you'll find it. Okay. And then for those editor roles, do they require a tech background as well or just an editorial no, content? Yeah, more editorial content. You have to be able to, um, you'll you'll learn some of the tech phrases and words and, and key things that you have to learn. Uh, but what we found, we, we sort of, again, this goes to the processes. We basically split it up so that there is a, a technical reviewer and editor and there's a non-technical reviewer and editor. And we have a lot of those roles as well. Perfect. All right, Carl, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Doug.